Praise the year. Um, it's really an honor and amazing privilege to be here this morning. And I must say, I've received a lot of words of encouragement from many elders who have come to me and say, you are welcome in Vord and Lieve. And even this morning, I've heard a number of elders saying to me, you are not going to be standing there in front alone. We will be praying for you, and I want to say thank you very much. Amen. And um, let me try my little bit of Africans, because in the last two weeks, I've been really practicing, and I'm learning some words in Africans. Uh, please don't laugh at me. You must encourage me. A crude yele almal and wonderlek nam fan Jesus Christus. I think I'm getting there. Pastor Ronnie, thank you very much and the leadership of Word and Lieve to invite me and my family to be part of this amazing church. And I've got faith and trusting that. God is setting this church, as he promised, on a hill so that not only Kempton Park or Boxbeck or Ekuruleni, but the whole of South Africa, the whole of Africa, and the whole world will look at this church and say, come and teach us what God is doing amongst you. I have a privilege this morning to share with us under the topic breaking the barriers and extending our boundaries. I am very passionate about this topic that I'm going to be sharing with us this morning. I've had the privilege of teaching what I'm going to share with us at the universities, for an example, University of Free State. I worked there with Professor Helena Van Zeil. She's the head of the business school. And every time I go there to speak, uh, you know, on this subject I'm going to be sharing with us, I also speak in many companies in South Africa on the very same subject and many, many churches. And as we are going to look at uh, breaking the barriers and extending, you no, know, breaking the barriers and extending the boundaries, friends, all what I want to share with us is, I'm sure we all agree that there are things that sometimes hold us back. And we all know that if we were to break this boundary or this barrier, our boundaries will be extended. And I want to believe that as Vord and Lieve, God has set us on a hill. But this boundary, this barrier will hold us back. And I believe that the more the children of God understand this, our boundaries will be extended. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus deals with this issue. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. I want us to listen to this. He says, you cannot, in other words, it is impossible. You cannot serve both God and money. Very interesting. According to Jesus, there are two masters. And the good news is the devil is not one of the two. Jesus says the two masters is God and money. And I need to be quick to say, many believers, they don't want to see money as one of the two masters. Jesus says the two masters is God and it's money. What is very interesting is Jesus is not teaching us to choose between, between the two. Jesus is not saying choose God or choose money. But Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. It is never the intention of the Bible to make us choose between the two. Jesus says, you cannot
word serve. Now, the word serve in the Greek is the same word for worship. What Jesus is saying in this scripture, he is helping us as a church to know how to relate to both two masters, but not to choose one over the other. According to Jesus, we need both. We need God and we need money. But we need to learn how to relate to God and how to relate to money. And how to relate to the two, according to this scripture, the Bible is teaching us that we can only relate to God by worshiping him. And we can relate to money by using money. In other words, we worship God and we use money. We don't worship money and use God. But we use money to worship God. We worship God by using money. Jesus makes this point more clearer again in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. And the Bible says, Jesus said to him, I weigh from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, God is to be worshipped. God is to be served. Can I hear amen for the ever? But we do not worship money, although money is the master. What do we do with money? Our relationship with money is to use it. But we worship him. It is unfortunate that everything that is meant to be used you can use it in two different ways. You can either use it rightly or use it wrongly. And because of lack of understanding and how to relate with money, especially Christians have more challenge with money. Many Christians believe that money is the root of all evil. Can I say, friends, in fact, lack of money seems to be the root of more evils. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 7, the wise man Solomon helps us how to understand this. He says, one man pretends to be rich, yet he has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Isn't it amazing, friends, that when it comes to money, people learn to pretend. Here is the word of your God. It says, one man who does not have, what does he do? He pretends to be rich. And the Bible says, yet he has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet he has great wealth. Can I say to us, friends, especially living in this amazing city, this province of Gauteng, the Bible says, never judge people by how they act what they wear, what they eat, and where they eat, and what they drive, and the size of the cell phone. Because the Bible says, many of those who pretend to be rich, they have nothing. But those who have, pretends to be poor. It's amazing. Friends, it's amazing that those who have, they don't feel like they owe anyone to prove that they have. But those who don't have, 
They want to show anyone as if they have. But the Bible says, shh, don't worry. They are just pretending they don't have. Friends, you see, this pretense is like a plastic ball in the pool. Take the plastic ball in the pool and try to sink it down. What do you do? You have to hold on it very tight. But you must be sure that the moment you let it go, what happens with the plastic ball? It does not only come to the surface, it shoots up before it lands on the surface. You will agree with me that we read about this on the, you know, on the newspapers. We hear this on radio. We watch this on television news. Many people who pretended to have and they did not have, we hear of them year after year. But praise God because the word of God teaches us how to relate to this. And the Bible shows us that so many are pretending because, you know, and, and let's read 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to verse 3. The Bible says, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. And she said, your servant, my husband, is dead. Now, let's just look at this. Any one of us will understand why this woman was crying. But the Bible says this woman who was crying, she was a wife of one of the prophets. And she cried to Elisha, she said, my, your servant, my husband is dead. Now, isn't it true, friends, that many of us will think that she was crying because her husband had died. Am I right? But the truth is, she was not crying because the husband died. How is that? Being a pastor, Pastor Ronnie just said, I've been in ministry for 32 years now. I have buried so many people and married so many people. But isn't it amazing that sometimes as pastors, if you are burying the husband, or you are running you know, the, the funeral service for the husband, and the widow is sitting at front, and she's crying. We always think she's crying because her husband, beloved, is gone. Sometimes it's not the truth. Can you imagine, if, if I had the privilege of preaching at the funeral service of this prophet here, and I would be saying to the widow, no, don't cry because one day you're going to meet him in heaven and God will be with him. He's waiting for you. And it is not in the Bible. I'm just, I'm just putting some words here. You know, in theological studies, they will say, I saw Jesus. I'm adding some words in the scriptures. I'm sure this woman, if I would say to her, be quiet. You know, you're going to meet her in heaven. He's going to be a love. Perhaps she will look at me and say, "Food sack, man. Don't tell me, don't tell me I'm going to meet him in heaven. Why did he rush to heaven? Why, did, why was he so much in hurry? Why? Listen to this. The Bible says, the next verse please. The Bible says, oh no, no, no. Let me read from, from you. The Bible says, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Can you see why she was crying? She is not just crying for the husband who is dead. She is crying because now the creditor has come. This prophet who was preaching and prophesying had so much debt that he was not servicing his debt. He was prophesying. He was preaching, he was attending the prayer meetings, he was reading the Bible. One thing we didn't know about him was that he did not service his credit. Oh, now I understand. 
You can even pray in tongues or rather shatter a wonder when you still have dead. You can preach fire down. You can attend church service. The Bible says, Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing. You know what? It's amazing. The Bible does not exaggerate. This woman says, I have nothing. The prophet died. A well-known prophet in Israel died. What did he leave for his wife and children? Nothing except death. And she said, accept a little oil. Little oil. You know what? This for me tells me all what this prophet left with his wife and children was only consumables. So they were going to use the little oil and it will be finished. Friends, what does the Bible say about this? First Timothy chapter 5 verse 7 to 8. The Bible says, give the people these instructions too. What does this mean? After you have given them instructions about receiving the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior, telling them about water baptism, tell them about being filled with the Spirit, tell them about attending prayer meetings, tell them to read their Bibles. He said, don't forget this don't forget to give them these instructions too. Why? So that no one may be open to blame. To be blamed with what? The Bible says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, listen to what the Bible says. Now the Bible says, if anyone does not provide, now this word provide is in the financial context. The Bible says, if one does not provide for his family, he has done two things. He says, he has denied the faith. Come church. In other words, how we provide, how we take care of our families is our measure of faith. The measure of faith is not only how loud I preach. It's not only how many times I go to church. It's how do I provide for my family. It says he has denied the faith. And number two, he said, and it's worse than an unbeliever. A prophet died. He did not provide for his family. Now Paul says, if we give baptism of Holy Spirit, if we give instruction on baptism in water, if we give instruction on reading the Bible, we must also give these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. Perhaps many Christians need to look at this and say, am I standing clear here? The Bible says, if not, you have denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. Friends, in Matthew 25, we're not going to read this, 25 verses 14 to 30, the Bible tells us about five things that are the causes of financial struggles. And friends, it is even relevant in 2016. Why are many Christians struggling financially, even when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, even when they are water baptized? Why are they struggling financially? Number one, friends, I want to say, it's lack of ability. 
When you read Matthew 25, you hear Jesus telling about the master and the three servants. One was given five talents, one, no, the, another was given two talents, and the third one was given one talent. And the Bible says, each according to his ability. What does ability mean? Ability means the means. In other words, one knows how to. Where to? And friends, can I say, the Bible has all the answers. We as Christians, we should be leading and showing people to say, we know how to. We have the means because the word of God teaches us. Number two, second thing that causes financial struggles is lack of capacity. I'm always in trouble with this one. With capacity, I want to say, friends, look at this. This bottle of water I'm holding here, it's written 500 milliliter. Am I right? 500 milliliter. But you see, friends, this is what I always say. It is not how much I earn. It is not how much I make. It is about the capacity I have to hold on to what I have. If you take this 500 milliliter bottle and take the 20 liter container full of water and let's suppose this is empty and you want to fill this and you empty the 20 liter into this. Listen to this. At the end of the day, you still have 500 milliliter of water. In other words, 19.5 will be on the ground. The problem is not with the 20 liter container. The problem is the capacity of this. Can I say, friends, I hear many Christians same everywhere, universities and companies, when I go to train people on this, no, I'm not earning enough money. I'm only earning peanuts. You know, if only I can be given, you know, 50% increment. You know what? Can I say to us, friends, the laws that govern success with money do not change. Only the amount does. The way you handle your 10,000 rand, even if you are given 50,000, you will apply the same rules you have been using at 10,000. You need to change your capacity. Yes. If the capacity is not increased for 50,000 and your capacity is 10,000, when you are given 50,000, you waste the 40. You only realize when you come to 10 to say, oh, by the way, I've got 10,000. I had a privilege last year to speak to this one union at one of the hotels here in Boxback. They were talking about decent wages. And I said to this union in my presentation, very good, well, you know, for whatever you do, I said, the biggest problem you create is this one. After fighting for people to receive increment, you don't help them to increase their capacity. You can give increment to workers, friends, until the capacity is increased, nothing will change. Number three, it's not putting money to work. You see, the majority of people, unfortunately, even Christians, they think that when you get money, the only thing you do with money is to spend it. Go read Luke chapter, Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son. The Bible says the young man, after he was given whatever he demanded from the father, the father gave him everything, and the Bible says he went to a distant country. Listen to what the Bible says. He says, no, the Bible says he spent all his money. That's what he did. And can you believe it, friends? This young man was given about 50% of his father's wealth. So one boy, 50%, he left the father, the mother, the brother, and all the servants. He went out, he spent the money, and he was broke. He did not do something very important, what the Bible teaches us. You see, the guy who was given five talents, 
The Bible says immediately after the master left, he went to put his money to work. Perhaps in the church, we need to teach more because, friends, I promise you, if, if all of us here start putting our money to work, we will have more money to give into Vorden Lieve, and Vorden Lieve will achieve more. The biggest challenge we have, I've been to factories, I've spoken to executives, people, all what they know of money is spend it. Never put it to work. Friends, can I say to us, if you put your money to work, it has been proven that money is a faithful worker. It never goes on strike. It does not apply sick leave. It works for you 24-7. You just need to know that and we are giving these instructions because Paul says this must be given so that no one must be blamed. Number four, the biggest struggle again is that many people, many people put their money in the hole. We're not going to talk more about this because this also sometimes lends me in trouble. In the hole. And this is what the economic system teaches us. Bring it here, we'll put it here, we'll put it here. After 20 years, you will get it as 1 million. And when you get it as 1 million, it's equals to 100,000 today. Putting it in the hole instead of putting it to work. Number five is fear. The guy who was given one talent. The Bible says he put his money to the hole and when the master came back in accounting, he said, I was afraid. Some researchers have researched and come out with six human basic fears and they put them in order. Let me give you them from number six going up to one. You will be amazed of this. They said people fear this in order. Number six, people fear. Oh, there you go. They've already given it to you. Number one, how do you like that? Fear of poverty. Friends, listen. It has been found that people fear poverty more than any other thing you can think of. And if you don't believe this, you will say people fear rejection or people fear death. Listen, it has been proven that when a man was very successful and he, you know, he loses everything, it is said that the man will take the gun, get ready, go home. What does he do? He shoots the wife, he shoots the children, and finally he turns the gun on, on himself. And what is the cause? He's so scared of poverty that he doesn't care about death. And actually, even if you can go through the list, the last fear, the last thing that people fear is death. But number one is poverty. Can you imagine if the church can challenge the spirit of poverty and teach people how to break the backbone of poverty? Many people will come to church because we'll be providing the answer that politicians are failing to give. It's fear of poverty, fear of criticism, fear of ill health. Number four, fear of rejection. Number five, very interesting, fear of old age. <laughs> and number six is fear of death. Let me land by just sharing these few solutions. This is in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, three solutions that the Bible gave us. And friends, this I received by revelation from God in the year 2006. And this has gone into universities. This has gone into companies. This has gone into churches. Listen to this. This is how we should deal with this. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning God created... Oh, number one there, can you see? He says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. The challenge, friends, 
of making money, according to the Bible, number one, challenge number one is vision. You need to know where you want to go. Can I say to us, friends, even before you earn your money, you need to know where you want to go with your money. Number two, accept that your salary is your first stepping stone to wealth creation. Your salary is your first stepping stone. And this is why in the book of Proverbs 24, chapter 24, verse 27, the Bible says, here is something very interesting. It says, finish your outdoor work. And it says, and get your fields ready. Other version says, first, get your field ready first. After that, build your house. Friends, we need to understand what the Bible is saying here. It says the first thing you need to do is that finish your outdoor. What is your outdoor? When you go out to work for someone, when you work in government or another, you know, someone's company, you are doing the outdoor work. It says then use what you get from there to buy your own fields. Means of production. And then it says, after that, only after that, build or buy your house. What does the financial or economic system teach us today? The moment you start working, because they can see how much you earn, because it comes in the bank, they say, you qualify for the house. And can you see what they do? They want you to start with the last thing. The Bible says, no, 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 no. Finish the outdoor work. When you're working out there for someone, then buy your own fields so that your fields can produce. When your fields are producing, only after that. The economic system says, no, 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 no. The best thing you can do, start by buying your house. The moment you buy the house first, you are locked into the system for the next 20 to 30 years. Number two, how to keep your money. And verse number six in Genesis chapter one says, and God said, let there be an expense between the waters to separate water from water. After God has created the heavens and the earth, he said, let there be an expense. The expense is the distance between the sea, water, and the sky. That is the expense. After God has created the heavens and the earth, he said, let there be an expense to separate water from water. Friends, can I say quickly, if we are to be successful in handling finances, after you have worked your salary, you must create an expense, you must bring order in your money by separating money from money. And Joseph gave this, you know, this advice to Pharaoh. He said in Genesis chapter 41 verse, verse 34, he said, let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth over the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Friends, we don't separate during the years of famine. We separate during the years of abundance. And let me skip that. That is to say, you, we, friends, we, we separate during the years of abundance. On point number two there, I said, your salary is like, um, can you see the fracture there? Can you show, show that? Skip the rest. Okay. When you separate, you get two portions. Portion number one, friends, and please, I'm not talking about tithe here. I'm talking about the 90% that has remained for you. You separate your salary into two. Number one, you get first portion, which we call investment portion. Portion number two is what we call lifestyle portion. Friends, if one day we are to be successful financially, you never take your investment portion and live on it during the years of abundance. Can I say on that point number three is to say, don't only budget to spend, budget to save. 
I always challenge people to say, whenever you do your budget, number one on the list, it must never be a bank. It must never be for your house. It must never be for your car. Item number one on your budget, it must be your name. I know that will take us time to explain. But you be number one on the list. If you put yourself on number last, money runs short just before you come to your name. Therefore, you worked for the whole month and you got nothing, but you distributed your money to everyone else except yourself. But if you are number one, you get the first portion. And some people will say, with that, how long is that going to take me? Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verses 11. It says, money gained hastily dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. How does money grow? Get that little by little. And we need to, to, to get into this and say, how do we do it little by little? And lastly, point number three will be, if you make money, you must learn to keep your money. And number three, that which you have kept, you must learn to grow it. And in verse 11 of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. Some people will ask me to say, How do I grow my money? I always say, If you make, you keep. If you keep, you grow. You grow by making profitable investments. Here is the last comment I can make. To make it grow, friends, you only need to learn the difference between these two key words. Number one is the word asset. You need to learn the definition of the word asset. What is an asset? An asset is anything that you buy cash or on credit that continues to grow or that continues to give you money back. The second word is the word liability. What is liability? Anything that you buy cash or on credit that continues to take money away from you. In other words, next time you want to buy something, you don't start by saying, is this beautiful? Is this, you know, top of the range? You don't start there. You start by saying, am I going to spend my money on an asset or a liability? It can be very beautiful, it can be top of the range, but the worst liability you have ever acquired. If we start by buying assets, assets gives us a privilege of then going to spend on as many liabilities as we can because already we have accumulated assets. I will have to stop here. But friends, can I say to us, God want to help us we will continue with this in the future but can i say i've written three books on these three points that i just finished with how to keep how to make and how to grow there are three books that are going to be sold when you know when you go outside there and the books it's a set of three books for 350 rand and if you buy one it's 150 rand which means it's going to be 450, but if you buy three of them, it's 350 rent. May the good Lord bless you. Thank you.